Good afternoon. Welcome to this EFI Foundation event, Modernizing the U.S. Grid for Resilience, Load Growth, and Energy Security. My name is Alicia Moulton, and I'm the Deputy Director of Communication. The EFI Foundation continues the work of the Energy Futures Initiative to advance technically grounded solutions for the clean energy transition through evidence-based analysis, thought leadership, and coalition building. Before we continue, two quick announcements. First, this event is being recorded and will be available afterward on our YouTube channel. Second, in the last 20 minutes of the hour, we will have an audience Q&A. If you have a question, submit it through Zoom's chat feature at any time during the event. We will read off questions during the Q&A portion and we'll get to as many as possible. And now to kick things off, I give the floor to EFI Foundation CEO and 13th Secretary of Energy, Ernest Moniz. Okay, well, thank you, Alicia. and. Um... Thanks to all of you who have uh, tuned in uh, for this uh, for this discussion. Um, uh, I should say a, a couple of words about the uh, uh, EFI uh, Foundation and the program uh, that is uh, the focus of today's discussion, namely the Energy Futures Finance Forum or EF Cubed. Uh, EF Cubed uh, is a is a, is a program that is uh, focused on uh, investment quality of uh, decarbonization, uh, namely. Uh, identifying policy barriers to large-scale uh, private investment flows, and then uh, trying to make recommendations to uh, to eliminate or at least reduce uh, those barriers uh, in order again to uh, to open up um, more private investment uh, flows. Uh, sometimes uh, those efforts focus, uh, in some sense, vertically uh, on a specific technology area, uh, such as CCS, and sometimes, like today focus more on a cross-cutting issue, uh, namely today the question of availability uh, uh, at scale of sufficient grid capacity uh, to support uh, the clean energy uh, transition. Now, we all know that adequate transmission capacity uh, is, uh, is, is critical to uh, ensuring access to uh, reliable, affordable, clean uh, electricity. Uh, there are, of course, challenges we all know about. Uh, including the question of adequate, proactive, long-term planning uh, for transmission investments, uh, so that they are so that the uh, the infrastructure is available in a timely way. Uh, and secondly, um, even if one decides uh, that a transmission line uh, is needed, then comes the question of who pays for it. How how are costs uh, costs allocated in a fair and equitable way? And and this, of course, can uh, can and has been leading to substantial delays uh, where what we are finding is uh, long uh, interconnection queues, uh, partly because uh, the of the in, in, uh, unavailability of some of the required uh, transmission assets. So um, uh, we all know it's necessary. Uh, and today uh, we're going to focus on, again, the EF cubed um, uh, analysis of uh, key problems of planning and cost allocation uh, as a way of trying to unlock these assets uh, and ultimately unlock uh, private capital flows. I should mention that uh, one of the uh, factors uh, that is um, calling uh, upon uh, resolution of these uh, transmission issues uh, uh, relatively quickly, uh, we hope, is the unprecedented load growth that we are seeing in the power sector uh, these days. Uh, and I'll just note that uh, on Monday of this week, uh, we published um, uh, on our website, uh, available for those who want to see it, uh, the proceedings of a workshop uh, that we held a um, month and a half, two months ago on managing unpredicted electricity demand growth on the path to net zero emissions. I think you all know that uh, factors such as data centers uh, especially perhaps uh, AI-driven data centers, uh, new manufacturing capabilities, many in the clean energy space, uh, like, for example, batteries and, and electric vehicles. Uh, and, of course, uh, the coming, uh, we assume, uh, significant increase in electrification of other sectors, transportation, heating, uh, perhaps some industrial processes uh, are leading to that, uh, to that load growth. And uh, certainly one of the approaches uh, to help manage that, especially with especially with clean resources, uh, will be new uh, transmission ca uh, capacity 
bringing us back again uh, to the subject of of uh, today's uh, today's report. The uh, I might also add that in that uh, load growth uh, workshop uh, under Chatham House rule, et cetera, um, uh, a number of uh, utility representatives uh, and and others. Uh, one of the major issues there uh, summarized in a quote. I'd love to have a large uh, clean energy resource that I could bring online by 2030. It doesn't exist right now. In other words, uh, is the load growth challenge uh, also leading to a bit of a train wreck uh, with the various uh, low carbon commitments uh, that have been made? So that's, again, part of the background in terms of uh, the motivation for uh, addressing these, uh, these transmission uh, issues. <clears throat> And uh, one of the factors is we all know that FERC will uh, sometime soon uh, be finalizing a rule uh, uh, relevant to this question of, of, of planning. Uh, we want to uh, help FERC uh, in terms of its uh, adoption of best practices and frankly, uh, making adoption of best practices a requirement uh, going forward. Um, and that will be part of what we will discuss today, uh, specifically uh, Jeff Brown, who is the uh, managing director of the EFQ program that I uh, that I mentioned uh, uh, earlier. Now we all know of some of the concerns uh, around the, the FERC the FERC actions. Uh, the uh, one uh, common refrain is uh, how a FERC uh, action may uh, threaten uh, state action. Um, uh, to, to exercise authority over their energy mix. Uh, I think Jeff will be uh, arguing that uh, quite the contrary. We think that uh, the that a good sound advanced planning will actually enable uh, the states to uh, in, engage uh, more effectively in ensuring that their priorities are, are put into place. And a second uh, concern often raised is that uh, transmission investments are a way of, of having states with uh, clean energy mandates uh, uh, and or uh, specific economic development policies, uh, such as attracting more data centers uh, and that uh, more transmit, more long distance transmission in particular is, is a way of, of shifting uh, costs uh, to, uh, to other states. But again, um, Jeff will be arguing, uh, we think that, that this is, um, that, the, that actually this can be made the opposite, uh, that um, freeing up this uh, transmission development will, in fact, uh, open up the possibility for states to, again, exercise their priorities uh, and, uh, and have fair cost allocation in terms of, in terms of benefits. So um, uh, Jeff will be going through this uh, just uh, in, in brief uh, as a, uh, as a uh, prequel. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, some of the key, key issues are uh, uh, how uh, uh, how to finance uh, and deploy clean energy at speed and scale will require uh, some of the actions that we will discuss, uh, how effective planning uh, makes decisions about how costs are allocated actually much easier. Uh, and I would just note that given my previous uh, job at the Department of Energy, uh, that uh, we believe that there's actually a significant role uh, for DOE. Uh, I want to make people uh, comfortable here. I'm not talking about DOE uh, getting involved in FERC's uh, regulatory responsibilities, uh, although I will note that uh, in the U.S. government uh, organization chart, uh, there is a uh, dashed line between FERC and the Secretary of Energy. Um, uh, I always focused on the dashes. Everyone else focuses on the blank spaces. Um, but uh, we certainly uh, uh, plan to, on we, we, we would certainly recommend honoring uh, that separation of regulatory authority, but DOE also has, uh, uh, through its programs, through its national labs, et cetera, considerable technical resources, and we should not underestimate how the long-term planning that Jeff will talk about is going, to, is going to require a new generation, really, of of some of those technical resources to do the planning adequately uh, 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 for the future and therefore uh, make sound cost allocation uh, decisions. So that hopefully gives you a flavor of where we've come from, where we're going, but the real story is gonna to be told to you now by, by Jeff Brown, uh, who, who led this project. And so Jeff, 
let me uh, turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you, Secretary Moniz, for kicking us off. And uh, let me also give my thanks and welcome to all of you for sharing the discussion today. And uh, also, you're seeing one person from our group, but I wanted to give extra special thanks to my colleague, Steve Camello, who helps run our effort, Michael Downey, Brandon Drysdale, and Sonia Griffin, who've all brought the midnight oil on this. So, Kicking, I'm going to kick off with a few remarks and then go to the slides. So, first of all, the value of a reliable, resilient, modern grid has never been clearer than it is today. And the U.S. knows how to build electric generation. We do. I was a developer. It's a project by project war. But the U.S. is failing proactively to build the wires that will allow the new generation to reach customers. So six overarching themes to what we're gonna talk about today. Um, first, as Secretary Moniz said, load growth is spiking after basically 15 years of absolute flatlined demand. Um, over the next decade, we're gonna need to add more electric generation than currently produced by all of Texas which is one of the single largest energy producing consumer states. And simply to carry that extra new generation, regardless of what kind of generation is chosen, is gonna require a massive expansion of the grid. Today, we spend about 20 to 25 billion a year on transmission. That's gonna to have to double conservatively. These are big, big CapEx dollars. And the type of transmission we're going to need to construct is much different than that which we are successfully doing today. Um, most of today's transmission is for lower voltage lines inside the service territories of individual load serving entities like an investment or owned utility or immunity. Um, in the future, we're gonna have to be building much higher voltage, almost all of it interstate. That's a different challenge. And why? Well, in the U.S., generation building is kind of a cowboy activity. You know, it takes one developer, one customer, you're in one state where you get cited. Uh, transmission planning, and the U.S. isn't good at this, is a multi-party thing, right? Multiple states, multiple utility sponsors, interstate lines, dozens of utility beneficiaries and their rate payers. Now, FERC attempted in 2011 with Order 1000 to set a framework that would foster multi-state, multi-utility cooperation in planning out grid expansion and figuring out who pays. But FERC states that contrary to their expectations, high voltage transmission construction has been on the decline in many areas and you know, outside of the major our ITOs or I, RTOs, ISOs, the process haven't hasn't been used at all. And instead, instead, there's a parallel universe. There's a separate system of procedures that can be used, but it's the wrong tool for the job to pay for backbone grid expansion. And that um, adjunct system has been pressed into service and it's in a relatively ad hoc manner uh, and as FERC says it's the wrong tool for the job we'll talk about that so in today's discussion let's just say we are not talking about the narrow issue of getting electricity from a few generators to market we are talking about keeping the lights on keeping the U.S. economy vibrant and expanding the grid to support economic growth and employment. What could change the situation? Well, Secretary Moniz said, uh, for proposed some reforms, and the reforms, in a sense, are oriented towards requiring, requiring, not politely suggesting, a set of sensible procedures for transmission providers to follow to break the current logjam. 
These ideas are so sensible and straightforward, one would think them to be just boring and non-controversial. You wonder why it, does this require a conference call? And because they're not considered non-controversial to everybody. But let's just talk, and we'll save some time on the slides later by hitting these now. It's to regularly, not sporadically, execute plans looking 20 years into the future. That makes sense because it can take five or easily 10 years to build a line, whereas it takes a year or two to build a project to generate. We need to look into the future. We need to examine a project portfolio, not one-off lines. Um, you know, physically a robust system needs lots of backup routes for power to flow. And politically, to get, generate consensus, you have to spread the wealth and the benefits. And in some cases, you know, that's an actual legal requirement. We'll get to that. Um, we should be looking at lots of different benefits collected at the same time, not looking at benefits in a narrow silo, just reliability, just avoiding congestion, because many, many benefits can contribute to making a line worth doing. Um, and we need to double check on two grounds. One is we need to double check using something like cost benefit analysis or flip it around benefit cost analysis to say this is a thing worth doing. This is not radical either. Uh, Congress told the Army Corps of Engineers to begin doing this in 1936, not newfangled. Um, and also to double check sub-regionally inside a big RTO or ISO to make sure that the sub-regions are paying costs as allocated by whatever system is chosen that line up are pro rata with the benefits received to that individual sub-region. That is how you bring everybody along in the same direction at the same time. So um, let's just two quick caveats. And again, this uh, repeating uh, first one thing the Secretary Mone said, EF Cube study is advocating an improved long-term planning cost allocation regime supported by FERC and to be implemented by regional transmission providers. But by no means are we suggesting eroding the power and influence of state regulatory bodies. And first of all, FERC in fact proposes to require, not suggest, the transmission entities seek the agreement of relevant state authorities within the grid's footprint. And second, let's be practical. In single state grids like Texas, California, or New York, state governments are directly in charge. They are the boss. In other grids, uh, states directly constitute the grid governance body, that would be SPP, uh, uh, Southwest Power Pool, or the states are overwhelmingly influential. Inside MISO, there's a thing called the Organization of MISO States. Um, and let's also be clear, I'm gonna be very precise about this. The prime mover for fixing the grid is not, repeat, not to make states that don't have renewable portfolio standards subsidize the states that do. Yes, if the grid is expanded and strengthened, more renewables, renewables with zero marginal production cost, which is a major source of economic savings grid-wide to everybody, regardless of state policies, Right, More renewables will find their way on the grid, but no, the investment case does not depend on a social cost of carbon or such measures. And uh, you know, the numbers we'll discuss will clearly support this. So with that, I'm going to tee up the slides. And how hopefully we are now sharing these slides. Um, so without further ado, move my screen here. Um, first, there are many places that we could have concentrated in this project. The red circled area is the area we are focusing on as long-term expansion of intra-regional backbone lines 
within ISOs and RTOs at higher voltages, like 345 to 765 kV. Now, if you look to the right per brattle or grid strategies, two pretty great uh, analysis firms, current spending is about 90% in the top three things, not circled. And the area that would create greater regional investment, lower costs, increased reliability is about 10%. We're talking about what's now 10% will need to be more like half. Um, what are our high level conclusions? Well, first, the lo this long-term regional planning is not a new bureaucracy or top-down industrial policy. It's a critical component and a complement to conventional annual capital budgeting, which now is done mostly just for reliability purposes. Reliability basically means fixing lines where you have had a problem. Um, the decisions about who pays for transmission can be simplified by integrating the planning process, which is where you identify, evaluate, and select the projects with the cost allocation process, figuring out how costs should be spread. Um, and the transmission investment is necessary to facilitate decarbonization, but the climate benefits of decarbonization are not necessary to justify the build out. Um, now, I talked about this backup adjunct system of the generator interconnect. Let's just drill down on this because this is a major failing of what is happening now. And FERC absolutely emphasized this in the uh, May NOPR. Uh, if you start top left, expanding the main grid requires long-term regional planning and you have to figure out cost allocation, fine. But what typically happens now is in a big, diverse grid, the RTO stakeholders will dispute benefits like what counts and doesn't and claim that costs in some parts of the region are not commensurate with the benefits received. So they will be dissatisfied. If they continue to be dissatisfied, they'll intervene at FERC. And if those stakeholders are unhappy with what FERC does, they will sue in federal courts. Delay upon delay. While that delay happens, the availability of new high voltage capacity or existing, pardon me, existing high voltage capacity, the spare room we have for new generation and to connect new load just gets eaten up. It disappears. We've got nothing left. So we have a failure. In response, we go to the backup process. The backup process is under two other FERC orders, 2003-2023. It's called the local or large generator interconnect process, LGIP. That assigns the cost of network upgrades related to someone joining the network to generators, whether high, low, medium voltage on a concept called cost causality. This isn't regional planning. This is adding up all the individual generators, seeing what they need. Well, it's an inefficient, clumsy way to expand the main regional grid. Why? Because as you try to figure out cost causality, you have to analyze and reanalyze these so-called clusters of new generators, could be 50 or 100 at a crack, as projects that couldn't stand the weight for transmission, crater, dead projects, and now you have fewer people and you have to study it again. So the generation growth stalls, projects die, and the interconnection queue grows longer. Uh, two days ago, Berkeley said it's now 2.6 million megawatts waiting in the wings versus US installed capacity of about 1.2 million megawatts. So the line of people waiting is more than double the size of the existing generation fleet. Um, so what does FERC say here? FERC says, A, if we don't fix the problem, we aren't running the railroad right and rate payers are going to pay too much. So at the bottom here, the current deficiencies may be resulting in unjust, unreasonable, discriminatory, and preferential commission jurisdictional rates. So what do they say? They have three broad concepts, and we'll talk about how they implement them. Um, 
A, you've got to perform sufficiently long-term assessment, transmission needs, account on a forward-looking basis for what they call known determinants of transmission needs driven by the changes in resource mix and demand, and consider the broad mix of benefits and beneficiaries. You have to map those big picture concepts on to the process flow. And there's two big parts, planning and allocation. Within planning, there's three main sets of tasks. And let's say first, it's to establish the parameters. What's the time frame? What are the assumptions about the future? How many scenarios do you run? And FERC spoke to all of those. Evaluation. Well, how do you sort out benefits versus costs? Which benefits? Which costs? How? A single project, a portfolio, many benefits, one at a time. Then you have to select what are you going to actually build? And that's where you need to double check it regionally and sub-regionally. Now, in one conception, now a gate comes down. And we're on to a new ball game. We figured out what we should build, but now we have to get states, fundamentally, to agree to pay for it. And, you know, basically, first we run up the theoretical check, and now we've got to argue about how to divide the check. That is a recipe for delay, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But for now, let's talk about these steps. Um, First, let's talk about this parameter part. Look, this idea, you think, doing 20-year planning and it would be kind of normal, but really it isn't. Today, big grid build-outs sporadically happen with these big, laboriously assembled portfolios, if at all. But on a routine basis, regions are mostly playing whack-a-mole to get rid of near-term reliability violations. So looking quickly, and this is from the National Transmission Needs Assessment, um, Texas built a lot of lines through 2013. Uh, the blue bars are high voltage and the uh, green polka dots are things that have many benefits. So um, if you look at SPP, again, a bunch of big construction, 2012 to 14, not much since. MISO looks like more recent action, but these are projects that were conceived of and agreed on around 2010-11 timeframe. They just happened to have been completed recently. Counter case, lower right, PJM, mostly just these purple bars, which is the whack-a-mole fixing reliability violations, not much in terms of long-term. Um, and, and FERC says it's important to figure out if you're going to do long-term plan planning, well, what do you put in these the scenarios embedded in the long-term plans? And they say certain factors are known and they're not conceptual, they're known. And one is economics of new and existing generation facilities. So one is renewables are cheap, even if they're not necessarily uh, you know, always running. When they're running and you put them on the grid, they're cheap and they save rate bears money. Um, State laws, utility IRPs that have already been accepted and other regulatory actions are on the books. They're not made up. And uh, the things Secretary Money has mentioned, electrification trends, energy efficiency improvements, and demand response. Now, again, let's talk about evaluation. Why multiple projects across the whole footprint of a grid? Well, the economics to show that costs are commensurate with benefits, politics, it helps to build consensus to share the wealth. Let's talk about multiple benefits. What does this mean? Well, here's the types of benefits that were included in MISO's long range transmission plan. And if you look, there are six different components of benefits adding up to the overall 37 to 69 billion of benefits versus 14 to 16 billion of costs. So you can get a sense the benefit to cost is pretty high, but two very big ones, uh, 13 to 19 are just straight up energy saving, energy cost savings from renewables going on the grid. And another one that's you know, stuck at 17 billion is savings in generation capital cost. Um, 
how what did the cost benefits look like? If you look to the right side of this graph, top left, about a 2.6 benefit cost ratio on the low side, 2.4 if you zeroed out any of the climate benefits shown in the sixth green bar here on, on the columns. Um, on the high side, 4.1 times benefit, still 3.1 without CO2. So when I said you don't need CO2 to justify the investment, you know. Um, SPP, interestingly, Southwest Power Pool, tends to do an after action analysis called their value of transmission investment report. And um, if you look here, the little portions of bars that are marked in green are the savings from optimal wind location. However, when you run the cost benefit analysis uh, on the low side, stripping out those green bars, just sticking to the plain vanilla, you know, reliability, energy savings, et cetera, that's APC adjusted production cost. Um, the cost benefit analysis is 4.7 without the climate benefits, 5.2 with. Climate doesn't make or break, but this same analysis sure as heck shows these are worth doing. Um, jumping ahead to our, our discussion of, you have to prove this concept that you are getting a good benefit to cost ratio sub-regionally. Why? Because court case after court case, um, you know, most recently uh, two decisions uh, in the Illinois Commerce Commission versus FERC emphasized that roughly speaking, the costs that you assign to participants have to be commensurate with benefits received. Not perfectly, but roughly. So the question is, if we look across the footprint of MISO in the various subregions that are on this little map to the right, how do things stack up? And if you see the dark blue bars on the high side, the benefit to cost ratio is in the zip code of you know high threes, low fours, um, with low benefits still. I'm sorry, I just got a notification. The slides are frozen. Good Lord. Okay, here we go. Um, pardon me for that. Here we go. MISO footprint to the right, different zones. They analyze cost benefits in the zones and uh, blue, dark blue, all in the fours to high threes. The lower benefits, turquoise, still all in the mid twos. And even if you strip climate benefits out of the low end, pretty much everybody's still in the two zone. This really does demonstrate that costs are commensurate with benefits. And that's why FERC approved the tariff that will implement this. Um, turning to one uh, last major uh, you know, detailed point, selection versus allocation. We just discussed this cost benefit analysis sub-regionally. Well, to do that math, you had to figure out how you were gonna allocate costs or you couldn't figure out the costs and the benefits in a sub-region. You have to know the cost allocation method to prove that things are fair. If you do that, you don't have much of a job to do in allocation. You've built the cost allocation methodology into your math. On the other hand, you could wait and fight about it later, which is what I would call selection light allocation heavy. Um, in the slides, we will distribute, you could look at this more at your leisure, but in the top are the benefits, the six components we described. And in the numerator, right, benefit to cost, what are the costs? Well, MISO takes the whole annual bill for transmission and they multiply it by each sub-region's share of overall MISO load. And you know that's how the numbers were derived on the prior page. The cost allocation method was already baked into the analysis. There was not a separate chronologically, uh, separate cost allocation system, and this sped up the pace of MISO consensus and for tariff approval.
Um, here, Secretary Money has talked about you know the difference between requiring and suggesting and uh, facilitating. So FERC had a mix of each in the NOPER, and really the question of the day, the question of the day is when FERC comes out with the final rule, how much will they uh, tend towards requiring versus suggesting? And if you look, um, the parameters, they describe many things, prescribe, but they don't particularly say what scenarios you have to run or how you wait scenarios when you try to decide what to do. Um, on the evaluation side, they do require transmission providers to say what benefits they're going to use and why they make sense. But FERC declines to prescribe what benefits you should calculate. And that leaves open a big window for fighting later. Um, Selection for it does require transparent selection criteria and effectively seems to require benefit cost analysis without using those words. Um, but there again is a lot of alternatively, a lot of flexibility about how to propose selection criteria, determine criteria, what methods to use. So the question is how prescriptive will FERC be? And then finally on allocation, they leave open um, and the ex ante system where you fight about it later. So let's go to our recommendations in the last few minutes. Uh, big picture, certainly FERC should stick to its parameters as set forth in the NOPER. Um, however, it would be helpful on the right to require that assigned probabilities are, are put to each of the scenarios or else it's pretty hard to create a decent expected value calculation, speaking as an economist. Um, evaluation of the benefits. Um, FERC doesn't prescribe a minimum set of benefits, uh, which Senator Manchin's most recent bill actually does. So prescribing a minimum set of benefits is not radical. Uh, and, you know, we would add that the benefit calculations need to be rock solid, transparent. And if they're climate, non-climate benefits mixed together, it needs to be easy for people with different views inside an RTO to split them out. Um, FERC advocates multi-benefit, regional and sub-regional benefit cost analysis. Yes. And the costs that are in the benefit calculation should match up with the ex ante cost allocation regime. And last, uh, FERC does allow other sort of the so-called state agreement process and where states will come up with their own allocation method outside the RTO planning process. For sure, if they wanna try that, there should be a minimum timeline which FERC prescribes and the ex ante method should be pre-filed in the FERC tariffs. Um, so what's our recommendations here besides FERC? Uh, well, for the stakeholders in the regions, you know, these new plans are going to require a lot more coordination, collaboration, and transparency than in the past. Um, and, you know, multi-state markets are going to face big challenging uh, coordinating the inputs and the large customers who are pretty silent in these discussions, really do need to step up. You know, the industries that want to build giant data centers, uh, the industries that want to switch over to electrification in their process, they need to step up and be involved. How about DOE and Congress? Well, three very specific things. One is straight up technical assistance. These benefit cost calculations that I described, to figure it all out is a fiendish, fiendish computational problem. Because what you have to do, if you're the grid and you're trying to do it right, you will have a base case, kind of what's going on now, and a proposed case. But the proposed case has to simultaneously figure out how to coordinate three different optimization models, a capacity expansion model, economic dispatch model, 
and the transmission topology and power flow models. Um, NETL, National Energy Technology Lab, is now engaged via the National Transmission Planning Study in attempting to do this, but they could probably use a lot more money and to produce a product that all of the ISOs and RTOs can use beneficially without recreating the wheel. Uh, two specific, uh, another DOE program, DOE should use and or expand existing programs that permit DOE to buy excess capacity and say super sized transmission line. And uh, for DOE, DOE can help bear the costs until demand catches up with capacity. And last on Congress, a 30% investment tax credit was available, pardon me, um, in the original Build Back Better plan. It was taken out in the IRA, a 30% investment tax credit, especially if it were on the direct pay basis, would really help to lower risks and ease rate payer shock. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. Uh, we covered the waterfront pretty well here in terms of what's in the FERC recommendation, what problem are they trying to solve, how do they propose to do it big picture and at a detailed level, and where they could be stronger, and where there's a risk that they FERC will be less than prescriptive. And I think with that, we're going to turn it over and uh, go with questions. So bear with me while I close various windows. All right. So I'm going to, so from the audience, we've had a number of questions and we're going to, I'm going to try to go up at bat first. I'll read the questions and try to give a good answer. And Secretary Moniz will join in as he feels. So from the audience, uh, one question was, how do we negotiate the race rate and cost allocation process between a low cost generating area like Texas and a higher cost area, New England, lots of transmission lines need to be built to transmit the low cost sustainable energy to New England. Um, that may be true. And let me just say that first, that was not the scope of this study. It was not. Um, the scope of this study, as we said, and pardon me, was the intra-regional lines, um, not the inter-regional lines. And if you can't sort out what you can build internal inside the regions, the problem of coordinating among many regions is just extra difficult. So I think we're gonna punt on that question, even though it's quite critical. Um, well, I would just add, uh, sure. Jeff, that um, uh, no, the, this, the question of the of interregional cost uh, differentials, I think the the questioner identifies a very very difficult issue. Uh, I know that uh, uh, I dealt with it uh, not only when I was secretary at DUE, but when I was undersecretary in the Clinton administration, where uh, transmission lines coming out of a low cost region were. Uh, not exactly embraced, uh, I would say, by, by that region. I think we're going to need some um, uh, some action uh, at the uh, federal appropriations level to at least get this kind of uh, thing kickstarted. To be perfectly honest, because it's a it's a hard problem. Yeah, it's a really hard problem. Uh, there's a second question, and I'm hoping I'm getting this right. And it was, what about? navigating the regulatory regional rate setting puzzle that we face in a timely manner, something Brattle Group and others have highlighted, and grid strategies as well. Um, I think what the questioner may be getting at is the cost allocation question, because when, when you have a regional cost allocation, th there isn't so much of a rate setting puzzle as that the uh, revenue requirement of the new transmission lines either gets added on at, uh, based on different algorithms. It could get added based on energy flows, which is a so-called postage stamp system, could be allocated on 
capacity, often called the license plate system or other methods. But once you've set that up, it's more or less the there is not a regulatory rate setting. It, the rates are FERC approved, actually, and the, the rates are simply built into the power as delivered on the lines or as load serving entities uh, are, you know, are allowed to use the regional lines. Um, what's the basis for using a 6.9% discount rate? Um, you know, that, that was a MISO selection of their discount rate. It seems reasonable as an after-tax utility rate of return. Um, but I don't, you know, they, they said, what is the systematic risk being assumed? I think that's a question for the MISO folks. But again, it seems pretty reasonable. Um, uh, fourth question was a recent New York Times article asked about advanced reconductoring as a potential way to facilitate faster and cheaper grid development. Do you have a perspective on that? How would it impact your findings? Well, if you can, and it's true, if you can use better lines that'll carry more electricity on the same towers and with better materials, so the transmission lines don't sag and catch trees on fire in hot weather peak load times, that is a great thing. And that may reduce the overall transmission spend, but building up the capacity of existing lines where they now sit really doesn't do much for increasing the overall density, like a circulatory system of the transmission system and increasing the capacity of existing lines where they are does not necessarily create alternative paths for electricity to flow if particular lines break down or particular whole geographic areas of generation go down. So the two are complementary. Reconductoring can help diminish the cost, but we're gonna still have a whale of a lot of costs to spread. Um, uh, Jeff, let me just uh, add in that, um, that uh, reconductoring certainly is an option. I just want to note that there are, of course, other technologies as well um, that can increase, uh, you know, dynamic line ratings uh, and the like. Uh, but I agree with what Jeff said. I mean, if you look at the projections for what the transmission re requirements would be to meet things like, for example, uh, reducing net emissions. Uh, by a factor of two, uh, even before the recent load growth uh, projections uh, were started to started to started to spring up like mushrooms, uh, the um, uh, it's staggering. And I think what, as Jeff said, uh, I think we should try to soak up as much of that need as we can uh, by increasing uh, the use of current lines. But it will come nowhere near. Uh, the requirements, uh, and uh, we're just going to have to build some new lines. And um, and the the key, and this goes back to the first question also about the interregional, that I think we're going to have to find ways of bringing new resources uh, to bear and to solve some of the problems where, frankly, a resistance to new lines might be diminished now because of things like the excessive load growth, uh, because everybody's looking for more power, uh, to be perfectly honest. And uh, clean power is better, but right now, uh, especially in the short term, as you all have seen, no doubt, uh, that there's a bit of a train wreck perhaps developing between the, uh, the load growth and the um, car low carbon commitments that most of the major utilities have made. So we have a lot of figuring out to do, but what we know is we've got to enable more new high voltage transmission line uh, build out uh, to be able to address the totality of the problem. Um, a few more questions. And again, just in view of time, we're hoping we interpret your questions correctly. Um, Question, based on Berkeley Lab analysis, the interconnect queues increased eight times over the last decade. That's true. Um, can you speak as to whether the annual project approval rate has also dropped? 
Um, there's a you know regulatory approval of generation, and then there's the financier or sponsor approval rate. I can certainly speak to the uh, sponsor side of this, which is the death rate of projects is extraordinary on account of not being able to be assured by the time you need to start construction that you will have transmission capacity that will carry your generation, what you produce to the customers who wanna pay for it by the time you get done building. Um, and that is a big issue and FERC specifically cited the number of projects that had died in MISO because of lack of transmission. Um, if we're talking about regulatory approval of PPAs, that's been more or less uh, chugging along pro rata to states, RPS requirements, and in other places like Texas, really just pro rata to the economic benefits of the wind. Um, we've heard uh, another question. We've heard that connection times for transmission are years long and that they're currently reviewing 2017 submissions. I guess that's SPP. What ideas do you have to shorten this part of the train wreck? Uh, and it is a train wreck. I think this goes to absolutely the very heart of what we're now discussing is the reason it takes so long to interconnect is because there is no spare transmission capacity, right? In other words, basically the system right now is the transmission system is carrying all the generation it can at max hours and generation gets curtailed in many instances. So the, the reason that the approval time and the interconnection times are long is because there isn't the spare capacity to simply do what's called the generator tie line, right? From my wind project or my nuclear project to the nearest substation where it can tie to the main grid, that's pretty easy to do. But if once I get to the main grid, the main grid is already full, that means that my generation project has to wait until somebody figures out the total needs of me and all my confrere generators proposing and gets the main grid beefed up and then I can interconnect. That's a heck of a long wait. So the solution to this is not so much a procedural solution, it's to get on mission and get steel in the ground holding up the towers and get wires strung onto the transmission towers, create some capacity to grow. And I think we may be, I guess we have time for one more and then wrap up. Is that right? Uh, Jeff, I'll just add in there, uh, just to throw in a, a separate issue, yes, but uh, since you mentioned the, trans the transmission towers, et cetera, I just want to note that uh, there are issues certainly beyond uh, the considerations of, of this report. For example, if we have that very, very large scale build out of uh, transmission lines, um, in a timely way that um, uh, that is needed for, certainly for the kinds of clean energy transition goals being talked about in the relatively near term, we will run into other kinds of commodity challenges, like, for example, just producing the commodities to build those transmission towers, <laughs> for example, uh, is not is not necessarily trivial. So uh, we've got to solve the, these the issues that Jeff has been discussing today. Uh, for sure. And frankly, if we, it, with success, we'll have a series of other challenges that we'll also have to meet. Excellent. You know, there's one more, um, and it's a great question. Um, instead of having DOE buy the excess capacity on large projects, why not tailor the basically regulatory cost recovery so it's small on the front end and large in the back end? Um, it's a pretty short financial answer to that is, when you have debt securities that are issued to finance, the interest has to be paid every year, whether the line is full or not. Um, when equity is put up to build the line, the return on the equity has to get paid every year, whether or not the line is full up. And so it's just very hard to, to since that's the bulk 
property taxes, insurance, O&M, it's very hard to figure out ways in the existing regulatory system to defer those charges far to the future for future generations. That's the issue. So I think that's- And Jeff, and Jeff has, yes. has mentioned the magic words also, under the existing regulatory system, there's another can of worms uh, opened up in terms of uh, what kinds of changes are ultimately going to be needed at a very large, at a very significant scale in terms of regulatory systems, which of course we also know are very, very different in different parts of the country and organized markets and uh, versus other, other places. So um, I would say that I think, you know, this, this report has taken on an important problem, but we, we also recognize and many of the questions have, have, have stated this, that, Lots of other things uh, have to come together as well for the entire system to move forward, uh, not only over the next years, but over the next decades. Yeah, and thank you for that, because the fact that we focus on the uh, planning and cost allocation, there's a lot of really smart people who say this is the killer problem as an ex-developer. It sure felt like that to me, but there are many, many other aspects of this problem but uh, let's say biting off this one just by itself is a beast of a challenge and we created a long enough paper and we've used up enough of your time. So I think we should wrap it up. Okay, well, um, um, I will proceed to wrap it up then. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll do so without adding, uh, trying to add more, more content to this discussion, which I think very rich one. We appreciate all the questions and we'll, We'll record these, and we may want to have further uh, further discussions, of course, with you. I do want to reiterate that um, that the executive summary of the report uh, is has already been posted on our on our website. Again, modernizing America's electricity grid for resilience, load growth, the clean energy transition, and energy security. So that is available. Uh, the full report uh, going through um, editing will be posted as soon as that process is finished. And as Jeff said, uh, we can also make these uh, slides uh, available. Uh, this is a discussion that um, will have to continue, uh, but the urgency uh, is one that um, simply cannot be turned away from. Uh, we need to do something differently uh, because doing the same thing over and over again, as is always the case, uh, seldom leads to to the to new results and the kinds that we need. So again, thank you very much. I want to thank Jeff uh, and the team uh, for uh, for their analysis uh, on this uh, important part of the uh, of the of 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 the puzzle. Uh, I also want to thank our um, EFI Foundation. Um, uh, communications team in particular uh, for really uh, putting this together and managing it and uh, I think uh, quite uh, quite professionally and we look forward to the ongoing discussion uh, in a variety of, uh, of formats and, and venues uh, of these issues of forward planning and um, cost allocation and all the other uh, issues that uh, that will come along uh, uh, with it so Thank you very much, and um, um, we'll be uh, we'll be talking again. I'm sure. Cheers.